Hello from Philadelphia and welcome to all of you around the world who are joining us for our fifth Wharton Ready livecast. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Capelli, Peter Capelli, who is Professor of Management and the Director of the Center for Human Resources at Wharton. And those of you who know um, Professor Capelli, he is a renowned expert in all things human resources, has done a lot of global um, consulting for both private enterprises as well as state governments. And he's speaking to us today about managing in the era of COVID. And before I pass it over to Professor Capelli, those of you who've been with us before know the routine, but let me just introduce this to everybody who is new. On this platform, if you have questions for Professor Capelli, which you will be taking throughout the presentation, please post those on the Q&A. And if you have any technical challenges or need help with anything, there's an icon above the Q&A, which is a silhouette of a person with a little um, voice um, part there. That is the moderator chat. So please type in any, anything you need for help in that moderator chat. And um, Peter, I'm gonna pass it over to you. We have over 2000 people who've registered for today's session. It's back to you. Good, thank you. And good morning uh, for all of you who are in the US. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And this is certainly an extremely strange time. I'm thinking about uh, over the course of my lifetime, what would be uh, events that were more unusual than we have lived through? I can't think of anything. In fact, I think we'd have to go back to the Second World War to find the last time that there was any event quite like this, so mobilizing so many people. Uh, it's been quite remarkable. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, one of the things that we are learning or will be learning shortly, especially with uh, blue jeans and video conferencing, is we'll soon learn what everybody's true hair color is because all the salons are closed and uh, many of us really need a haircut. My hair is living in homage to Boris Johnson here. I think it's going all over the place and there'll be a huge queue in the barber shops as soon as uh, we are available to get there. But let's talk more seriously about what's going on in the world of management as it is affected by the coronavirus and the COVID uh, uh, illness from that. Um, there's something that's sort of fundamentally tricky about this whole situation, uh, and that is the underpinning of it. And these debates we hear reflect this. And the underpinning is this view that uh, we're killing the economy the longer we shut down. And the other view is if we don't do something about it, shut down, people are going to die. Uh, this is going to matter a lot uh, in a few minutes when we talk about the problem of how to get people to come back to work um, once they are physically able to do so and the restrictions are, are lifted, right? Um, those of you who've taken executive ed courses uh, from us may have at least years ago heard this story, the parable of the sadhu. It's a famous uh, sort of teaching case basically about what you would do if you come upon somebody who is uh, stranded and dying and they're getting in the way of some important goal that you are trying to achieve. This was a story about mountain climbers who found somebody on the side of the, uh, of the trail and if they took them down to the mountain, that was gonna be the end of their trip, which was something they had planned for years and sort of what's your responsibility to others is the point of the of the tale. And that's what's going on here, right? Now, for most of us, this is the first time we've had a big trade-off between our immediate self-interest and that's work and money uh, and saving lives. Uh, and how much is appropriate uh, is a question that we just don't wrestle with very much. You might be amused or interested to see that the US government actually thinks about this explicitly when they're passing regulations to try to decide uh, how many lives we should save. Uh, how do we think about that versus the cost to the economy of imposing regulations? Uh, there's some people who have actually been studying this now and it looks like, uh, you know, there's a you could say either a big benefit or a big cost, depending on what you think the numbers uh, look like. I should also tell you, we're gonna give you these slides if you'd like them afterwards. So um, we're not gonna cover everything on them right now. The problem is we're hugely inconsistent as societies as to how we value life, right? So, uh, you know, if there's a young child who fell down a well, we move heaven and earth and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the poor kid out. 
But on the other hand, we also know that in the developing world, uh, a few dollars would save the life of a child because we're very short on basic uh, basic needs there. So, you know, we're pretty inconsistent with respect to this. And so one of the things we have not thought about very much explicitly, at least in the U.S., is just how much is worth it. Uh, and that debate is something which is ugly and unpleasant right now um, because of the view that it's on some sides that we shouldn't even have that debate. Um, and partly, uh, though, unfortunately, we can't uh, avoid it because this is what we're in the middle of, right? Um, and let's get down to business here about the problems of management. Here's a, this is a U.S. survey, but it's a quite stunning result that uh, employees trust their own employer more than they trust the government. Uh, to tell them the truth about what is going on with respect to the coronavirus and the shutdown and what's appropriate. And maybe this reflects something about our lack of trust of government, but it's also a responsibility on the employers to tell people what's going on. And for sure, we have to tell them what it is we're expecting them to do or they're not going to do it, right? So let's see if we could tick down the big questions that we're facing with respect to uh, the virus, uh, the first thing which we're already well into the middle of now, and that is uh, demand is falling short in most organizations, not all, but but most. And what do we decide to do about excess capacity? And you see companies all over the place on this one based largely on what their own demand experiences are. Um, but one of the things that we have not maybe thought enough about is the distinctions between trying to maintain an employment relationship with employees that is furloughing them, at least in the U.S., uh, you can collect now all the benefits of unemployment insurance and other things if you are furloughed. A furlough is an involuntary time off. Um, so you're not firing, you're not laying them off, you're not dismissing them. Uh, and it seems that the employers in the U.S. have not done this very much, and I'm really surprised why. Uh, because if we think business picks up at some point and you still have people on furlough, it is straightforward to just bring them back. If you lay people off, you got to go back in and hire new people. Uh, maybe the same ones are there before, but maybe not. Uh, you got to go back and hire them to bring them in. Uh, so we're not thinking very much about this. I think it's probably a mistake. The other thing we're not thinking very much about is the ability to try to deal with this by cutting hours, uh, scaling back, cutting pay. Uh, this is something that we know a fair bit about from the 2008 recession, the Great Recession, which is not that long ago, right? And there was an ideological debate, I think, within corporations about whether we should uh, scale back, ask everybody to make a shared sacrifice. Uh, and the view was that, well, if you do that, your best performers will just leave you. Um, that turned out not to be the case, and I think generally it is a great way to build a collective sense uh, that is asking people, can we all pitch in to save jobs, right? Um, I guess part of the issue, though, is do you really want to build that collective sense? Do you want to build that common culture in the organization that is we are in this together? Um, and, you know, to be blunt, not all companies want to do that, and not all of them feel that they're really in this together, which is um, an interesting choice, but it is a choice about ideology rather than management. Because I think if you're interested in the business doing better afterwards and still being the same kind of business you were before, make, making people feel as though you're in this together is a really important thing for keeping them going through this period keeping the employees going, and getting them to contribute to their discretionary effort where they really have a choice as to whether to help you or not. Um, and that is a fundamental issue in management, right? Whether we can get people to do that. So let's talk about another issue, and that is in many companies, particularly bigger ones, what you find is that it's not just that the total amount of business has gone down, it's gone down in this part of our business, but maybe in some of these other parts, it's actually gone up. So we now have the problem of imbalances inside our organization. What do we do 
uh, about that. And I've seen some kind of interesting uh, innovations here with uh, little efforts of internal bidding and posting, but also sort of talent scouts sort of things, as an expression I've heard from an insurance company, where they're trying to match people who have slack capabilities, uh, resources in parts of the company, or just time on their hands with where things are booming. You could imagine, for example, companies that are vendors that are supplying different businesses find that some of those businesses you know, are drying up. If you're providing food, for example, to the airlines, that's going nowhere. But if you're providing food to healthcare providers and hospitals, that could really be booming. So can we figure out ways of how to move people around internally uh, appropriately where the demands are and it's a hard thing to do bureaucratically. It seems to be easier to do it with something like an internal marketplace where we're just swapping information. Hey, we need help over here. Hey, I got people who are sitting on their hands over here. I've actually seen some companies that are loaning their excess employees. These folks have nothing to do, but we got a client here or maybe even a vendor who is overwhelmed. And some of these companies are loaning their employees to Amazon, for example. All right, we'll send you a thousand employees here who have nothing to do with us right now, uh, and we'll keep them on our payroll. And you just, we'll send you a bill, you send us back you know, the money, and off we go, right? It's a very creative uh, sort of approach, but I think you know, this is a moment where being creative is probably a pretty important thing. So let's talk about this issue here, working from home, which for many people and many companies is the biggest change. I saw some new data since I sent these, uh, prepared these slides uh, from companies, uh, surveys of top executives who reported, much to my surprise, that their biggest challenge right now was not really dealing with the downturn and demand, it was managing uh, people who are working from home and also that they thought their biggest takeaways after this whole experience begins to recede, however long that takes, will be concerning remote work and working from home. So, you know, this is kind of a bigger story than we may have uh, given credit uh, to it. So let's talk a little bit about it. There's many issues here. Uh, the first one is, you know, who can do it? Uh, figuring out what work can be done from home uh, takes a little bit of thought, you know. Uh, and I think what we have typically done, or most of the companies that I've talked to have done, is they just sent everybody home and said, uh, we're going to try to get our IT people to help you, but maybe not. Um, just go home and try to do your jobs there. And that's all probably we could do, given the time constraints on this, right? But we haven't thought always very thoroughly through what jobs have to be done on our location, which ones could actually be done at home, what's essential? And curiously, by those definitions, executive jobs are probably not essential. You probably don't have to be in the office to do most of those jobs, right? Uh, I think the biggest issue, we'll talk more about this in a minute, is we have sent employees home without giving them a pretty good sense of what it is we're actually expecting them to do, how we're managing their performance at home. Uh, nor have we thought very much about replacement planning for those essential jobs. So we got a few people, got to be here, their work has got to be done or everything shuts down. You think about public utilities, for example, right? Really crucial. Um, and there it's important to have replacement planning going on. You know, what if Bob comes down with a virus? Because there's a pretty good chance that uh, this virus is going to continue to infect people and we're gonna have absenteeism at a pretty high rate uh, for quite a period of time. What happens then if this person goes gets sick in a key job? Who takes their place? Who steps in? What we have often done is just rely on managers to step down uh, to fill some of these jobs under the assumption that the managers kind of know what their subordinates are doing. It's not always a great assumption and we might want to think about this as an opportunity where people could step up rather than everybody stepping uh, down, the managers, where we could give a subordinate the opportunity to try to take on a new task, right? Uh, so thinking carefully through replacement planning for these key jobs is something that we haven't done 
maybe in a very sophisticated way and maybe not at all, but this problem's not going away, right? Because the virus is not going away. And by the way, working from home is not going away either because even when we start back up, it's not clear that everybody should or needs to be back at work, especially if we have to maintain social distancing, right? Here's just some data. This was collected a while ago. I'm just moving my camera here a little bit so that I'm not going back and forth quite so much. Uh, two screens up in the modern world here. Uh, this is from the Brookings Institution, some data that they collected about from the Gallup people, actually, about who's working from home. And what you can see, uh, maybe this isn't a huge surprise, is that the people who can work from home tend to be people with the better jobs. And the people who can't uh, work from home are also the people who are most likely to uh, just be laid off or they're lucky furloughed. So this has some bigger social implications as to what we're gonna do for people who are already um, lower income and didn't have a lot of resources to buffer themselves in this downturn. They're the ones who are getting you know, hurt the most from this. So let's focus in on this working from home question a little bit. Uh, Gallup survey done a little while ago before the virus started, found that 72% of Americans say that they have worked uh, from home or kind of are working from home. So you might say, well, what's the problem? This is already going on. Uh, the problem is, what do we mean by working from home? You know, if you're a white collar worker and, uh, you know, you get to cut out on Friday afternoons to take your calls at home and get a jump on the weekend or um, as part of uh, you know, some other kind of PTO arrangement, you could occasionally do a little work when you're on vacation. I mean, that's all working from home. That is not the same thing as shutting your office down and going away for weeks at a time, right? And one of the things that we know about social contact in particular is that um, motivation falls if you don't have it. Uh, and if you think about it, you think about all the things we do in our workplace to try to motivate people and to get them to work hard. You know, you got peers around you, you have office space that's conducive uh, to work. We try to cr minimize distractions around you. We also kind of minimize what you can play around with on social media in some cases. Your boss is there, there's a lot of interaction. All those things are designed to push you along. And we're taking all those away. So what do we think is going to happen? Well, there's some things we know just are not gonna work well, right? Like agile project management, you can forget it, right? It's really hard to do this uh, virtually. Um, and collaboration, really difficult to do virtually, especially the way we are working from home now, and that is uh, people are really working kind of asynchronously. They're doing their work, but they're also, you know, like not on camera, all uh, nine to five, they do their work some of it in the evening, during the day, they may be doing something else. So trying to collaborate is pretty tricky. What we've known for a long time is the best predictor of whether this works is how independent the tasks are that you're doing. So if you're doing something that doesn't require a lot of um, interaction with other people, you can be home, it's not gonna matter all that much, at least for a while. But we also know that the longer that you are away from other people, uh, engagement levels fall. Um, and we also know that when people have an option, they really don't stay away forever and they don't stay away all that long. We know from managing virtual teams, the key thing is to get people back in to the office as often as you can so that they have a connection to each other and that we can't do, right? So one of the things we need is to develop a template First thing is we can't let line managers decide anymore who can work from home. And the reason we can't do that is mainly those decisions were based on ideological preferences, right? So you could have the same job working for person A and they let you work from home a few days a week or a few hours. Person B won't let you work from home doing the same job because person B thinks you're just watching Gilligan's Island or some TV show when you're home, they just assume you're goofing off. But we can't do that, we can't have that ideological decision-making anymore. We have to have rules and norms about who can work from home, even after the virus uh, concerns are lifted. We also have to do a better job of managing performance. Managing performance means letting people know clearly, what is it you're supposed to be doing at home? What are we gonna measure? That is, what counts as good performance? 
how frequently should we be checking in? And it ought to be a lot more frequently than we're doing now when people are working from home. And are we going to have time, and you should, for people to be have guaranteed contact? So I'm going to be at my screen. You can text me. I will respond during these hours so that we can try to have something that looks as much like collaboration as is possible from a distance. Supervisors have to change what they're doing as well, right? So I have a, a former students who have done some nice research on this before the coronavirus, looking in consulting firms where people are working from a distance. One of the things they found, which I think is interesting, but maybe this will resonate with you, is that new, man, new supervisors actually were not bad at managing people remotely. And even though they tend to be bad at managing people in the office, and the reason is their bias tends to be to micromanage and not give people enough space to do their work because they're nervous, they're new at this. When people are telecommuting, working from a distance, it's hard to manage them in a micromanagement way. So working from a distance actually helps in some ways new supervisors to maintain the appropriate kind of distance. But for jobs, uh, that are more complicated in particular, where that means more interaction is required, you really need supervisors to do more than they were doing before. They got to run interference because the person working from home doesn't necessarily have the appropriate uh, social networks. Uh, they need to anticipate problems, provide resources. Working from home, you can't always get them yourself. And so one of the things they found is, you know, for jobs that are complicated, you really need your best supervisors. So the punchline there is maybe we should rethink how we're allocating tasks to supervisors in this world where a lot of people are working from home. And again, this is not going away, even when the states in the U.S. and the countries elsewhere begin allowing people to go back to work. Right? Now let's turn to this, uh, maybe one of our last questions here, and this is a really tricky one, which we really have not thought about very much. And that is, we got to get people to come back to work. We've sort of assumed that as soon as we open the doors, people will be coming back in. But actually, if you look at the data on this, uh, really interesting evidence just, just came out, shows that many more people, at least in the US, are concerned about restarting the economy too quickly as compared to those who think we're taking too long to do it. So there's a lot of people who are afraid to go back to work right now. And whether they should be or not is an interesting question. But one of the things that employers have to do is a communication campaign to persuade them first, we need your help. The company cannot keep going unless you can come back and help us. And they have to understand what happens, not just to the business, but ultimately to their jobs. If we can't get this business rolling again, you also have to persuade them that we're going to keep you safe uh, at work by doing a bunch of the things that we now believe are important, like maybe wearing masks, like social distancing. You can't expect them to go back to work and not see that and feel comfortable if they leave work and they are seen, right? Can you make them come back? This is U.S. law. Yes, you can. Now, here's an interesting change since I wrote this uh, slide. And that is the in the U.S., the EEOC, Employment, uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has issued a, uh, advice saying that you can test your employees and require that they're tested for COVID virus or coronavirus before you bring them back to work, right? Um, so there's a bunch of things that you can do. You probably want to be talking to your lawyers in the U.S. before you do these things. Uh, but we need to have a protocol about bringing people back in and not for sure, not just assume that all we got to do is call them and they'll all be coming back. Now, here's something we can't do. Uh, very unpleasant stories about a lot of companies punishing people, especially healthcare workers, for complaining about safety issues. Uh, at least in the U.S., you cannot do that. It violates the National Labor Relations Act, protected and concerted activity. You can talk to each other and complain about working conditions. That doesn't mean you can necessarily go to the press about it, uh, but you can't prevent them from complaining and talking to each other, right? So there's a bunch of things that we should be thinking about going back, and here's our little list of takeaways. We've got to do more planning up front. We have to have clearer policies. We really have to think about managing people who are going to work from home because this is not going away, and we have to have a plan about bringing people back to work, making them feel comfortable, first so they'll come, and second so they're not freaked out when they come back.
Uh, so let me turn it back to Mike. I think it's uh, maybe time for some uh, questions too, uh, but I will leave it back to my folks who are someplace distant, but they feel like they're right next to me in this virtual world. Thank you, Peter. We are going to take some questions at this time. Um, so we are going to run maybe a couple minutes over if we need to, just to make sure we answer a couple questions. Uh, so that being said, Peter, a lot of questions coming in about finding balances between maybe working from home and going into the office once we do return to that. Um, do you see any type of ways or norms that might become of that? Because some people mentioned they're going a little crazy being on all these Zoom calls. And yeah. Granted, their health is important. Uh, they're going a little crazy. So what will, maybe some methods that you would recommend for that? Right. Well, I think the social distancing is probably going to have to happen, particularly if you've got open offices. You're going to have to think about doing that. You know, I've seen some places where they're already putting up barriers, uh, you know, plexiglass barriers between uh, individuals when you have open offices, right? So you could certainly see that. We're gonna have to get rid of meeting rooms, our, our scale down meetings, our break rooms are probably gonna have to be closed. And I would think it's important when you're bringing people back to get volunteers to come in first. Now, almost no matter what their job is, people who are glad to come back and happy to be there, you'd like to start up the first couple of days with those folks being there, having the procedures in place, so that when the people who are afraid to come back start coming in, everything is running smoothly. The people they see all are cool with being there, right? So I think that's uh, what I would do. I think we want to try to bring back as many people as we can. One of the reasons for leaving some people at home is simply office space may not be big enough to do the social distancing that we're probably going to have to do for a while. Great, thank you. So another question that's coming in uh, frequently is in ensuring high-performing uh, teams as well. Um, how do you see that happening on like a, the virtual standpoint? Is that something that we can obtain via virtually as well with all the restrictions? Really hard to do uh, because one of the things that makes those go is constant uh, conversation and feedback and impromptu interactions. Hey, I just thought of this thing. What do you think about this? So one of the things I think we have to do is uh, create opportunities where those folks can ping each other. There are times of day when you have to be online, for example, right, which we're not doing that very well. Uh, and But otherwise, it's going to be difficult, uh, for sure, because it's hard online to maintain those kinds of social relationships. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so again, when we do open offices back up, people are concerned about mass transit concerns as well. Any suggestions for those people who may have to start coming back in but are a little worried about dealing with uh, commuting as well, because that's impacting a lot of things currently. Yeah, I, it's a little beyond, I guess, the employer's control. I mean, you can make people come back, but I think if, if you have a choice, and you probably will for a while, at how many people we bring back in, uh, it might be better to have some sort of volunteer arrangement uh, so that people who really are concerned about um, public transport or afraid of that or something, you know, can at least figure out how else they might be able to get to work other than public transit, take some time to do that, uh, and take some time maybe for things to, to chill out. But, you know, part of the problem of a caring employer is that uh, at some point you still got to do your work, right? And if you've got people who are afraid to come to work because they're afraid to travel um, and they can't figure out how else to get there, I mean, at some point they've got to show up because you can't keep people on the payroll if they if they won't come to work or they can't come to work forever, right? So the problem. Really hard to think about now, um, but when we do start going back to work, what about vacation leaves and just leaving for a couple of days off? Do you think, um, how, how will companies handle that? You think? Uh, make sure I understand the question is whether they can keep taking vacations and time off and things like that. Or the structure about how we go about taking vacations, requesting them from an HR perspective. Do you see that changing? Uh, probably in ways that I can't quite uh, imagine now, but my sense is that the economy is not going to be roaring back, right? So it's not going to be the case that, you know, the day that uh, sanctions are lifted and we can all come back, Social distancing is allowed, people are allowed people to come back to work. Business is not going to go kaboom like this. So the problem is not going to be that we're so busy that no one can leave. So I imagine the bigger concern is uh, is just paying for it, right? Since um, if we 
have scaled back the staff appropriately, and we probably have not, um, that uh, we got to pay for it somehow. And, you know, it might very well be companies say, look, we, you can't keep, we can't maintain the vacation schedule we had before, given that we've, particularly those companies that have been paying people while they're on leave for a long period of time, that gets pretty expensive. So maybe that changes as well. All right, so I'll just post a comment with a question from a participant right now. Um, so a senior manager, they're involved in 10 to 12 conference calls a day. This leaves that very little time for creating and developing initiatives. And what are some good strategies to let corporate know we need to cut down on the over-communication? Right. Well, I, I don't know that there's more communication now than there was before. You know, one of the things that we knew is that people thought there were way too many meetings. And you see these statistics on the amount of time that people are spending in meetings in their companies. So one of the interesting things you might do now, given that these digital, visual, virtual meetings are such a pain to do compared to being in the office, is ask ourselves, why are we doing them? If you're spending that much time doing these uh, now, um, why are we spending so much time doing meetings in the, in the office? How is it, if we can't get our work done now, what were we doing before? And the answer is we were killing a lot of productive time with meetings we probably didn't need. So maybe this is the time to rethink it. All right, so I'll take a couple more questions here. And people are wondering how you can manage or motivate uh, the employees that are working from home, maybe for the first time, and maybe they're not achieving some of their goals that they normally would be in the office. How do you kind of deal with that? Well, I think better performance management for sure is what we have to do. Uh, and that means telling people, here's what we want you to do. This is it. And for supervisors, we often don't do that very well. Here's what we're going to measure and we're going to be checking up on it. You know, I think one of the things that kills motivation for people working from home now is they can't see why it matters. You know, you're at home, you do this report, you send it in, you don't hear anything, nothing happens. You, you feel like it's not paying, nobody's paying attention. And so this is a burden on supervisors to give people more feedback than we're probably doing in the office, uh, because in the office there are other ways that you can get this sense that people care about what you're doing and that it matters. Uh, and so it's sort of a burden supervisors have to complete to let people know that, yeah, we're looking at this, it's important, um, and here's what we thought of this one. You know, so that I think is the, the important thing, the, Simplest, the most important thing to do. Okay, one final question here. Um, so as an employee, somebody's wondering, how can they help our employer to consider uh, to move to a work from home standpoint when maybe they're not as open to it? So from that standpoint, maybe a company not wanting to do it, or maybe not the employer or employee, but the employer. How can you get your point across that way? To an employer. Right. Yeah, so how do you persuade the employer to do this? Well, you know, there's a fair amount of research on this, um, suggesting that at least if you construct it the right way, the working from home for a while uh, seems to work particularly well. People cut down their commuting time. They're pleased by that. It gives them more time to be productive. For independent tasks, you're not pestered by people. It's easier, more productive. So I think the problem is uh, most of the people who think in principle working from home at all is a bad idea are people who just don't have an accurate sense of how things actually work. They don't believe you can trust your employees. Um, you believe that as soon as you're not watching them, they're screwing off. And I think if, if that's your view as an employer, um, it's troubling, right, that you think you can't trust people uh, because it means that you're managing them in a way that is killing performance and you're spending all the time monitoring people, right? So something's wrong with your leaders if that's their view. There is a lot of evidence on working from home that you can look up and present to them. And right now, you know, my sense is talking to a lot of companies, they seem to think this has worked reasonably well for them. Um, and if you don't trust your employees, you might ask yourself, why don't you trust them? Why do you think they would cheat you, right? Why do you think they would goof off? Uh, and ask yourself what you might be able to do about that. So thank you for taking all those questions, Peter. I will turn it back over to you for final thoughts before we turn it back over to Mike. So please wrap it up. Uh, well, we got our list of takeaways over here and we can get you these slides. This is a fascinating period we're going through. I guess the one thing I would encourage you to do is 
think about what is so unusual about what you're seeing now because this is a way of learning before we go back to the old model we'll fall back in the old model very quickly and we'll forget some of the things we might have observed or learned about what seems strange about the model we just left now that we're sitting at home and we don't have it. Uh, Mike let me pass it back to you and then off we go Peter, thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Lots of useful and very practical takeaways in that one, as well as food for thought for going forward. It seems like the new normal that we are in now is going to become the old normal once we transition back, and there's a lot to work through. So thank you again for a dynamic presentation. And for those of you who stayed on, we have a great companion presentation next week with Professor Martin Haas, on virtual teams, building engagement and productivity. Parts of you know, Peter's presentation really spoke to the importance of that. Martine will bring very recent research and her own thoughts on those issues. So look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks again for joining us at the um, Warden Ready Livecast and be safe and stay strong. Thanks. Mm -hmm.